Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Carol Waller, and I'm the um, executive director of the Type Directors Club, and we're thrilled that you're here tonight. Um, I'm just going to start off with um, what we have coming up next. We um, have Talking Type with Saki Mafudikwa, and Sa uh, Saki is from Zimbabwe. So we're looking forward to hearing what he has to say. And that's next Wednesday, the 17th. And um, the following week on the 24th, we're having Ken Sai Lee, and he's coming from Taipei. So you see, we're going all around the world. It's very, very exciting. And then um, designing type, the more I learn, the less I know with Karen Chang. That'll be on March 4th. And then the history of our Arabic graphic design will be the following week on the 11th. So um, sign up and we'd love to see you there. And now I'd like to introduce you to John Kudos, who's on the TDC Advisory Board, and he will introduce our speaker. So John. Thanks, Carol. Um, I'm John Kudos. Very nice to see everybody here. Um, I'm very excited to welcome Masashi Kawamura. He's actually broadcasting live from Japan, uh, Tokyo. So it's good morning to uh, the, those vlogging in from Japan. And it's 7 p.m. here in New York. So we got, I think, the, the whole gamut here <laughs> from uh, West and East. Um, I'm going to read a quick introduction about Masa. Masa and I actually um, knew each other um, I would say in 2008, uh, I met him at the ADC Young Guns um, opening, and it was just by happenstance we connected. And you know, I've been following Masa all these years, and he's been doing really interesting and amazing projects. So I'm I'm really excited to welcome him here. Uh, Masashi is the chief creative officer at Whatever Inc. He continues to explore creativity in a variety of fields, including advertising, music videos, product design, digital installations, et cetera. He has been chosen as one of the Creativities Magazine's Creative 50 and Fast Company's 100 Most Creative People in Business. Without further ado, Masa, you <laughs> welcome and uh, we're ready for you. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much, Carol and John, for the lovely introduction. Um, hello, everyone. I don't know how many of you are watching, um, but my name is Masa. I go by Masa for short. Uh, and as John mentioned, I'm the uh, chief creative officer or you know creative director in short uh, at a company called Whatever, which I've uh, recently started uh, two years ago. Uh, before that, I used to run a different company called Party. Um, so you can tell I like weird names for my own uh, companies. And uh, today I want to do a quick talk about uh, whatever makes you smile using typography. So I have to show you some of the work that's, uh, that I've made in the past that's loosely related to uh, typography. I'm only saying loosely because we're not uh, sort of a design studio that focuses on typography, but we love to kind of hack and uh, make weird and wonderful uh, things. <laughs> um, and within that, you know, there's definitely typography is included because that's, I would say, is one of the most fundamental sort of design elements um, that you can play around with. So uh, going down my slides here, uh, John did a lovely intro for me, so I'll just skip, but I worked abroad uh, most of my life. I'm Japanese by nature, but uh, you know, traveled around the world, lived in Amsterdam, worked in London, I worked in New York, um, and then started my own company party back in Tokyo, but then went back again in New York. And I was actually sharing offices with John. So uh, it, before the COVID hit, you know, we were, we were working together there. Um, but now I'm back in Tokyo. And uh, the reason was that I've started this new company called Whatever, Inc. Uh, yes, I do get uh, stopped a lot at customs and uh, during immigrations, uh, being asked what my company does. 
Um, but basically, uh, you know, after all my experience in working in the field of design, I've sort of gave up on trying to uh, identify a specific sort of name or title or uh, position for my own company. We used to call ourselves a digital design studio or like a digital production company, creative agency. But basically what we love doing is to create basically whatever makes people happy or whatever makes our client happy, the audience happy, the world happy, you know, through whatever means possible. So lots of keyword, whatever, you know, was uh, existing there. So we just said like, okay, well, we're kind of tired about uh, spending time thinking about our company name. So we'll just call ourselves whatever. Uh, we're based in Tokyo, New York, Taipei, and Berlin. We're a very small company. I think there's only about what, 40 people in total, but we love to be scattered around different time zones to make sure that we're reaching the most interesting partners and interesting uh, clients that we can find in the world. And again, uh, we, we love uh, making whatever. So uh, I have a quick reel just to uh, share you what kind of stuff that we are making. And then from there, I'd love to share some of the case studies uh, of the work that's again related to typography. So um, that was a very short reel of all the sorts of work that we've been doing in the past uh, two or more years. Um, and uh, it sort of, I guess, shows you sort of the breadth and the uh, differences in the type of work that we do. We make like weird uh, plush toys to uh, interactive installations in uh, Singapore's Changi Airport to uh, TV show openings to commercials to, you know, games, etc. We love coming up with ideas and do the designs, but we also have uh, engineers and architects in the team. So we love to kind of start from the thinking and finishing off with the making under one roof. So it's kind of a hybrid of a creative agency model and a uh, production model. So uh, we're kind of in between the two. Um, but as I mentioned uh, earlier, I feel like whatever work that we do, you know, typography is definitely related, you know, from the logo designs to, you know, how we create the communication designs for the landing pages of different brands uh, or even, you know, CIs and logos, et cetera. Um, so I was wondering which work we should show, but some of them were a little bit more, uh, you know, deep into uh, typography, uh, which is sort of um, typographies were rooted in the core of certain projects. So I tried to pick up four of these on things and 
explain to you uh, sort of the process, creative process behind how the idea came to be and how they were made. Um, and some are client projects and some are just a project uh, that I did on my own. And the first of which is uh, a music video called Hibi no Nero. Um, this really kind of boosted my career in film directing. Uh, I used to be a coder, then I flipped a designer, and then I started making film on my own. And then, you know, this really uh, put me on the map. And from then, you know, I started to get a lot of uh, music video directing jobs. Um, but during the time I uh, came up with this concept, you know, I was working, I just arrived in New York, I think. It was really around the time I actually met with John. And... Uh, this was for a Japanese band uh, called Sour. And uh, to give you a backstory, you know, they were actually my uh, friends from high school uh, and they had this sort of indie band in Japan. I actually made two other videos prior to this for them. And then uh, for the third, uh, they came back to me uh, because the first two were quite successful. You know, they told me, hey, we want another music video, uh, but uh, same as the previous ones, we have zero dollar budget and uh usually you know it's it's one of those situations you should probably say no to that type of uh brief um even if it's your friend but when i listened to the track it was actually really good probably the best that they've done so far up to date um so it was hard for me to say no and uh, but the real tricky part was that you know again the budget was non-existent and i just arrived in a new country called uh usa in new york uh, so I didn't have much uh, friends there yet on the ground to support me in terms of film production. So I had to be uh, kind of clever in terms of what kind of idea um, can actually be pulled off in a way that, you know, doesn't look cheap uh, and could still be uh, interesting and intriguing. So um, uh, long story short, but I'll get there after I share the video. You know, I came up with the idea to uh, shoot the whole film using uh a video conference, um, which was Skype back then, and stitched them together to create this sort of multi-screen uh, choreography where uh, different people from different parts of the world come together and create this formation of unique sort of animations together. And this work has been um, awarded at the Tokyo TDC Award. So I thought this is sort of relevant to kick off the um, Examples. So I'll show you a short uh, section of the video and I'll explain about how the process came to be. Wait. So yeah, that's, uh, if I show the whole thing, I'll probably lose my time. So uh, 
I'll keep it to there. Um, definitely, please check it out on YouTube later on. Um, it's interesting because you know nowadays after the whole COVID, you know, struck the whole world. You know, there's been more and more uh, video and film production done through uh, online video chats and webcams, um, and which kind of looks similar coincidentally to what we did uh, like almost ten or more, twelve years ago. Um, so I think we were really early uh, in terms of using this type of technique uh, to achieve sort of this artistic expression. Um, so I'm really happy that we, you know, we uh, came up with the concept, but it didn't, uh, the idea didn't come uh, that easy. Again, you know, the budget was zero. I had to figure out a way to shoot something that's cheap, but not looking cheap. Um, or it looks actually intentional that it's cheap and authentic. And um, the song itself was uh, singing about uh, sort of how you connect with people and finding sort of your individuality through everyday life. Uh, uh, the translation of the title is, means uh, tone of everyday. So I wanted to kind of uh, come up with an idea that could sort of embody that message um, and try to think, think, think for uh, two or three uh, weeks, but can't really, you know, come up with something that, I can pull off, you know, for a non-existent budget. Um, and, but then one day I was on Skype with the band uh, discussing them and almost giving up on the project saying like, oh man, guys, this is probably going to be impossible. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I can make this or even come up with the right idea. But then I uh, immediately started to realize that, you know, this thing called the Skype uh, was something that people are starting to use to actually connect with people that you can't, you know, meet with physically. So I felt like, well, maybe this is really an interesting, um, you know, new trend that's happening. You know, people uh, connecting online and uh, virtually meeting with people and connecting with people. I felt that's really aligned to what the message of the song was. So perhaps I can actually use Skype to film the whole thing. So I'm going to be using my webcam on the MacBook. And uh, I don't know if it was even called MacBook back then, back then but... Uh, and uh, filmed the whole sequence using my webcam only in New York and then, you know, shooting people in Brazil and Tokyo, China, et cetera, et cetera, and stitching them together to create, create a music video. And um, because it kills a couple of birds and several uh, in one stone, I guess. Um, it's, you know, cheap. I don't have to rent equipment uh, to, you know, even the cast members, I can probably recruit online uh, through social media. And then three, uh, last but not least, you know, it's it, the technique itself really uh, emphasizes the message of the song. So I thought this is going to be great. And then so I changed my mind. I, at the end of the call, I said, like, wait a minute, I could probably do this. So let me let me try it out. And uh, started working on the concept, uh, which you're seeing in, on the screen right now. Did a lot of sketches from uh, two by two screens to three by three, four by four. And I think it goes up to uh, eight by eight towards the end where you see 64 people in one grid. Um, and, uh, you know, thought about, you know, what you can do with the same uh, single technique and just circled ones that I liked and stuff like that. Um, at the end, we actually shot about uh, 70 people, if I remember correctly, from 12 different countries. So um, the production was pretty crazy. Um, so I worked with um, three other directors, Hal Kirkland and a uh, team called Hoo Hoo, um, and sort of shot, you know, uh, separately uh, all the 70 people. So like 20 people each kind of, and uh, had them edited all together at the end. But I think uh, nobody's really done this before. So we had to really make sure, you know, each of the scenes in choreography worked perfectly and also that uh, these people that we were casting were not actors but real people so we had to figure out sort of a method to uh, for them to be able to dance at the right rhythm and so that it's like uh, it could be sort of glitchy and uh, not completely synchronized but we don't want something that's completely broken so uh, we uh, had to kind of shoot everything once in animatic so <clears throat> for example this part was the scene where you saw earlier with the camera. You know, this was the early sketch on who's going to shoot what and then how the scene transitions. But then we shot, this is me and Hal. 
we had this kind of video animatic that we had to create ourselves to check if the timing and the pacing and the motions were, you know, not fast enough or not slow, not too slow so that it fits in the right section of the song. And then that ended up being this, which is, you know, basically the same thing with just uh, just us doing it, but with different people in different locations. So same here, <clears throat> like the face part, you know, do we have enough time to like really close into the camera and connect? We knew that we could do the two faces, but you know, how would it look with the four? So we went on and did this kind of video test. <clears throat> and same here. Um, there's a section towards the end where you have this kind of teardrop uh, that connects, but you know, we just did it on our own and did the test video. Then what we did is that we sent the test video to each of the audiences or the cast members and told them your, your grid C2, and then you kind of have to move in sync with that. So they were watching the video at the same time as they were on Skype and we were recording that in New York. So it's kind of a mind fuck, <laughs> um, excuse my language, um, but, that's what we had to kind of do to get this video um, right. And at the end, you know, it, the video is very successful. I think about what, 4 million views in a couple of months. Uh, so for an indie band that had zero budget, it was really a successful case. And again, you know, uh, in terms of the context right now, I think it, uh, the visual looks very um, <coughs> relevant nowadays, now that everybody is actually you know, staying at home and cannot connect. I think this video um, is getting another traction again um, because I think it really touches people's hearts um, because of the technique that we use to produce it. Um, and off to my second one. I don't know if my pacing is right. I might not get to the end of the presentation. Um, this is another uh, personal project that we've done, uh, that I've done actually uh, called the T-shirts. I think this might be the most typography related uh, project in the mix that I have today. Um, so uh, I don't know if this needs a lot of explanations. It's basically t-shirts that's shaped in the typeface of different uh, T's. And uh, I made ones for Helvetica, Kaslan, uh, Baskerville, Career, and uh, Cooper Black. <coughs> Excuse me, um, I should have brought a bottle of water. Um, and uh, I don't know why I came up with the idea, to be honest. I think I was fascinated with typography and some day, like at a weird moment, I think I probably felt like, oh, it could be kind of a funny thing if I made t-shirts that's really in the shape of a T. <laughs> um, but from there, you know, I was like, well, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe it could be really interesting. Um, and, um, but I wasn't uh, obviously and isn't still a fashion designer. So I uh, had to find someone that will be interesting enough that understands garment making, but also is open enough to, you know, try and help me out with this like strange, bizarre concept. And found a guy called Itaru who uh, ran his own sort of uh, fashion brand called No Control Air in Japan. And we started working together in terms of the shape and size. And, uh, the funny thing is that uh, as soon as we started to actually make, try and design garments that's wearable, uh, it's immediately started to become more or less of a shirt and into a dress um, because in order for a person to wear it, you know, we had to make the sidebars uh, big enough so that the arm could kind of fit in. And when you start to do that, you know, the whole uh, ratio of the letter, whole size becomes gigantic. So, uh, we had to figure out a way how we can reduce that basically uh, was the big challenge. So um, originally, so this was probably closest to the original vision. This was Cooper Black. Uh, oh, and another funny part is that the sizings were done in points. So this was 4,458 points in actual size, <laughs> which you can wear. Um, but originally we were intending everything to be flat like this. You know, it's probably the most easiest to build. But again, you know, uh, depending on the typeface, uh, it became very hard to wear and it just became gigantic. You know, this is still okay. Maybe it's not, oh, sure, it's not a t-shirt. It's more of a dress, but, you know, it, it became more like robes if, if we were to stick to this 2D uh, design. So Itaru had this uh, very amazing idea to 
extrude the typeface so that it's actually sort of in 3D. And that actually um, allowed us to make the garment have enough, uh, I guess, enclosure and size without making the whole ratio of the letters even bigger. Um, so this was Baskerville, uh, 3,980 points. Um, and then because again, it's extruded in 3D, we, were, we didn't have to extend that um, sidebar part too much. Um, so it was still wearable at this size and still managed to make it into sort of a dress. Um, and each of the letters had different sort of um, shapes when you wear it. So this kind of had this kind of scarf element around it. It's actually a no sleeve um, dress. Uh, Helvetica was the most sort of normal one, um, 2,852 points. This one, I think you could call a t-shirt, which I was relieved. At least we have one that's actually a t-shirt. Um, and then Kaslan, oh, uh, funny story. Uh, there's a very important typo there, which says Kalsen. Uh, very funny. I was freaking out when I noticed. Um, Kaslan, 2,940 points. So again, as you can see, it's kind of extruded in 3D. This made it extremely difficult for fabrication. So everything had to be made in ha by hand. So the pricing became uh, very high. Uh, I think we were able to manage to produce about 10 pieces each or something and sold it at a limited uh, edition on time. Um, but that was a very interesting uh, project. You know, it came out of nowhere. Uh, we, you know, thought it's funny. We built it. Uh, we did some sh photo shoots, and uh, it has been traveling around the world to a couple of sort of exhibitions. Um, so I think I think it's sort of intriguing and uh, weird enough for people to kind of um, be interested and uh, laugh about. Um, oh, and we forgot about the career. This is also another different one. It's more like a cape. And so um, moving on to a third project, this is back to some client work. Um, it was uh, a music video called The Bell for a different Japanese band called Androp. So uh, because originally they were not a friend, now they're a friend, uh, they actually did have a budget. So I could do something a little bit more, uh, how should I say, uh, grandeur, so to speak. Um, and this song uh, was singing about the difficulties of uh, communicating with people. Um, I wanted to create a music video that sort of uh, you know, embodies that message again. And uh, then I think back then, this was 2011. So Twitter was becoming like the massive thing. Um, so I thought, well, maybe if I can make some interactive video that use this, you know, something like Twitter where, you know, you could actually send a message to your friend and that message becomes like a character and you can follow the journey of whatever you typed into the website. And uh, that slowly sort of shape shifted a bit. Um, so at the end, uh, we created this video where, you know, you go to a website, you type in the uh, Twitter address of your friend, you, you have to log in and then you type in whatever message you like, you press play and that, message that you wrote um, becomes combined into this character. Uh, so here, you know, there's that dog character in the images, but that's that's what you're controlling, like in a Mario, Super Mario world uh, made out of uh, typography. Um, so this one, oh, this one also won the Tokyo TDC award. Um, so this is, I think, a case study video. This is an interactive music video for the song Bell by the Japanese band Androp. The song Bell sings about communication and the delivery of music here. video game. When you arrive at the site, <coughs> you can choose who you want to send a message to using Twitter and type in any message. So this is sort of an actual screen you recording. Play, your message will transform into an animal. It was all uh, web-based. Depending on its length, it will become different animals. Control your animal through the landscape, which is synchronized to the music. Whenever you hit an enemy, a letter from your message will be swapped out. The more you hit, the more your message gets broken.
The objective of the game is to try avoiding the enemies and deliver your message safely to the goal. Yeah, so you kind of get the idea. So this is a music video version, but I'll also skip this because it's basically the same thing. Um, but uh, whenever we do, you know, an interactive something, you know, we, we make sure that we have just a simple video version of that. So, you know, whoever cannot actually access or play based on, you know, the devices, they still get a chance to kind of see what's, what's going on. Um, so. And, uh, you know, I wanted to try and play it today too, but unfortunately everything was built on Flash. And as you all know, you know, Flash has been discontinued. So all the stuff that we've done, you know, during this like 2000, early 2000s and 2010s are gone now, which is very unfortunate. But if you're interested, please check it out on YouTube. We still have that video version online. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it surprisingly doesn't look too outdated. You know, it's about 10, 12 years ago um, already. So, um, but I, I think we intentionally made it to look 2D and uh, using sort of these grainy look and feel. So maybe that helped so that it's, it's sort of um, still look fresh. Um, these are some of the um, early sketches we were doing for like the enemy characters. Um, at first, you know, we were gonna actually spell out shark to make the shark's face, but the design was like too tricky to figure out and make it look good. So we, we just kind of ignored it. So the shark is like A-M-X-O-Y-V-V, -V, but you know, hey, um, still looks like it's made out of letters. So we lived with that. Um, so these are sort of fun experiments that we were playing around with as we created the whole world. Um, then the typeface is actually unique. We, we had to build a system so that we can create all of these um, characters and uh, especially our main character, you know, out of these typefaces. So um, this was like sort of an outlined um, EPS files and we converted them into uh, a set of a whole typeface system. And um, sorry, again, it's, it was made in Flash, so I don't have the working program, which would have been nice if I was able to show you, but the left is sort of the screen capture from the system that it was like a character builder that we've created to actually create the characters that goes into the game. Um, and uh, you can change the number of letters, you can change the, um, you know, the actual uh, characters inside of it, uh, change the scale, uh, change the way it's split. Um, and in order to create this sort of a mosaic um, of typography uh, that doesn't sort of break um, the system or it still looks good, uh, we use this algorithm called the Bornoi diagram, which basically what it does is like when you point at two points, uh, the algorithm um, creates this borderline in the center and smack center of the two dots. And however many dots you make, it, it continues to do the same. So it shows you sort of the equal distance between these two points. And um, that's how we use to morph each individual characters um, to fit within a certain silhouette, but still you know, does not, I guess, uh, disrupt and break the outlines of the character. So it still looks like the same character. It's just the way it's um, segmented inside is the only changes that it does. And it works for any, uh, letter of the alphabet. So that was a tricky part that we had to crack at the beginning, but we were and we were able to do that. So, you know, we, using that, we were able to create these different sort of um, characters. Um, so whatever letter you type in, it still, it still works and looks sort of the same. Um, so one to four letters with the mouse, so more more letters you typed in, the main character that you control became bigger and bigger. So uh, rabbits, dog, horse, rhino, giraffe and elephant is what we've created. So this is a very um, interesting challenge for us. Uh, we did a lot of interactive gamings and interactive videos before, but you know, treating typography like this as a main element and a whole holistic sort of theme for the art direction uh, was really a technical challenge, but you know, we're happy that we were able to make this work. Um, 
And uh, last but not least, um, all the ones that I've shown previously were like pretty old. So this is an ongoing project. So a recent one that we're uh, using a lot of typography in is called the Lyric Speaker. And uh, this is actually a joint venture startup that we've uh, built together with three other companies. So we have a separate company called Kotodama that's uh, in charge of manufacturing this. For us, it's a real um, IP. It's a Bluetooth speaker um, that we've built from scratch. And uh, what it does is that it's, uh, uh, once you sync it up with like Spotify or YouTube or any sort of music device, it actually recognizes which song it's playing right now, uh, accesses the server uh, and uh, shows up these uh, typographic sort of kinetic typography animation that plays in sync with the music that you're playing on the speaker. Um, the one on the right that you're seeing was the first one, which sold out, I think last year. And the second one uh, is the one on the left, which we call the canvas. And that's the one that uh, is still in the market right now. Uh, you could probably buy it on Amazon. So if anybody's interested, please do. <laughs> um, so this is how it uh, works. Sorry, this sounds pretty big. particular I sniff them out indubitably usually very accented against the background and I don't back down fools must be cracked so you know as you can see different typefaces um, appears and different uh, motions are, are installed so Every time you play it, it's almost like you're seeing a unique um, animation. We are also using the same system, just the software side for live shows as well. I think this was at South by Southwest uh, a couple of years ago, but because it's such an easy system to create these uh, kinetic typography animations, um, it's easy for the artist to just plug and play and boom, you, you already have something nice to show at live concerts. Um, and in terms of this, I wouldn't get too geeky. So this is almost explaining nothing here, but um, in terms of the SDK, what it's doing is that, you know, there's a motion graphic data and the typography data installed in the speaker. Uh, when the music plays, it immediately goes to these two different places. You know, one is the music analysis side. So it acts as a server on the cloud. It uh, uses that to determine uh, which song is playing and its BPMs and uh, stuff like that, the, the timing that everything needs to be uh, synced with. And then the other side goes to the lyric data. We're using a third party lyric database. Uh, so it cross matches with the song title and figures out which song it is and downloads the uh, word by word sort of lyric data. Um, and we combine these two to create this like completely synchronized animation. And everything is made in Unity. So it's really uh, easy to export to different platforms. Um, and you may have noticed, but uh, all the animations and all the uh, typographies are not a complete 2D graphic, but we're actually plotting them in a 3D plane and moving them around so that it has a much more dynamic feel to the animations. Um, and I think the tricky part, um, our CTO told me he's actually the only programmer that's building the whole program side of things, which is crazy. Um, but uh, the word by word lyric synchronization is very uh, is really key to get everything coming up at the right time. Um, for the lack of better words, it's like an awesome current OK speaker. That's <laughs> what it is, basically. Um, and this is sort of a bit more in depth in how it's working in the background. So we um, not only uh, get the song title, but we also do an internal sort of um, definition or defining the song into these uh, 12 different, I guess, emotional values. So that when you're playing uh, a song that's like energetic, you kind of get an energetic animation happening when you're playing like a ballad or a slow love song, you know, you get an animation that's much more slow and organic and the typeface is, you know, goes into more of a uh, serif classical font uh, compared to like a bold, you know, um, Helvetica. 
uh, sans serif fonts. So that's that's how we kind of keep on pumping out and generating these uh, animations that matches the music well. Not only it's completely synchronized to the music, but hopefully we wanted something that's um, tonally matching the song as well. Uh, lots of questions that we get is that language-wise, yes, we cover uh, English, Chinese, Japanese, Korean characters, which means Roman alphabets are all covered. So with that, you know, uh, hopefully it's covering quite a lot of languages. So if you do play a French song, it does recognize uh, the song and it, it plays for you. Uh, typography, typeface number wise, you know, it's increasing almost uh, daily, but you know, we, we started with like 30 typefaces and 15 motion data and we just combine them uh, within this sort of parameters to get the unique animations happening. And, uh, and this is the second one that we've created. <laughs> So we design it so that it looks like <laughs> two uh, record sleeves um, stacked together side by side. And the front part was the, um, oh, this is, where, where is it? Yeah. So th that was the one on the left. Um, the one reason we did that was that uh, the original one, which was the one with the transparent LCDs that you see on the right, you know, that was really expensive. So uh, um, we were like, okay, the more we sell, we're losing money. So let's let's not do that. And the second one, let's make it profitable. So this one we threw away sort of the transparent displays. And now it's this uh, black display in the front and the, the back panel that looks like the gray mesh is actually the speaker panel. So you hear the music from there and the whole black part is sort of the canvas, you know, where the lyric animations play. And again, this is this is in market right now. So whoever wants to purchase it, it's not cheap. <laughs> I think it's about what uh, one thousand five hundred dollars or something. But I, I heard that the Kardashians bought it, so they, you know, <laughs> maybe it's good for uh, Valentine's gift. Um, yeah. So that's. Um, that was all the projects that I brought to you today. And again, you know, we are not a design firm that like focuses and centralizes in typography, but again, typography is a very fundamental element for any design that you work on. So funny thing is that it has a super long, you know, history. It's really evolved with, you know, the evolution of mankind, but still when you mix it with different technologies there's always so much interesting thing that you can do with it so hopefully you know these examples sort of opened up the way you look at typography and you know stimulated you enough to you know start thinking about weirder you know crazier stuff that you can uh use for it use for um so thank you so much that is my uh talk session and off to you, John, or Q and A. I think. Yeah, thank you, Masa. Um, maybe you can stop sharing your screen yep. so we can go into Q and A. Here we go. Yeah, I mean, it, it's. I'm I'm quite familiar with your work, but I think when whenever <laughs> I see, um, you know, you talk about the process, that it always intrigues me. You know, because I didn't realize, for example, that Androp. Uh, bell uh, music video with Daniels, how complicated that was to produce the the type generator right mm -hmm. I, I can't even start to imagine like where you know how do you actually code that um, <laughs> <laughs> flash baby flash <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> goodbye flash right <laughs> yeah. so uh there are a few questions so i'm gonna read them for you uh from courtney garvin what do you think is the most important software slash application slash coding that a designer should know to be able to fully explore and design in the digital space Ooh. and not to be restricted by technology? That's hard. Coding is technology. Um, <laughs> I don't know. For designers, I would, I would say like well, one advice that I do give to designers, uh, regardless of what application you should remember first, is that, you know, you probably should not worry too much about actually learning to code yourself because in uh, many cases, you know, there are better coders than you out in the world already. So if you know that you're better with the design side, all you need to learn is sort of the 
capabilities of you know what technologies can enable you to actually create and to understand sort of what it takes to use that technology like how long will it take to code this thing or how long will it take to engineer this thing you know where can i actually shortcut so that i don't have to go to this complex route but you know do a more dirty prototype to make something happen so understanding sort of the abilities of tech and understanding almost the language of the coders, not the actual coding language, uh, may sometimes be more important. You know, if you know how to talk in the right way and explain your visions from the design side to the right coders or the engineers, they can potentially handle that side for you. So, you know, depending on what, where you are at your career, you know, maybe, you know, if you're like already over 50, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, you could still learn code, but, you know, rather maybe all you need is that understanding of the technology field and then apply that to, you know, curate a team that can build things for you, you know, but if you're still early, yes, you know, coding could be very interesting to learn, but I would say there's almost like too many codes <laughs> and so many options you can start from, um, basic like HTML, sure, you know, go there. That's, that's not going to go away. So, you know, and then that would actually, you know, lead you to things like the Java's and JavaScripts. So, you know, which is like a very, you know, I, I wouldn't say easy, but uh, again, a basic sort of um, coding skills that you would need to do anything web-based, which again is going to be the future. Um, so, you know, I, I would go there. And if you love visual programming, you know, open frameworks and processing and stuff like that, still very, you know, major. Uh, lots of people are using them. So maybe stuff like that, if you want to start seeing if you'll, you'd be interested in visual coding and stuff, um, I, I would probably suggest those. But again, don't, don't feel like you really need to be able to hands-on code things. Like I would not go back into coding again. I studied like, C++, I was on like a Unix thing and, you know, I did the whole Java early days, but I like, I, I was bad <laughs> when everything that I wrote was dirty. And then when Flash and Shockwave came out, I was like, whoa, this is, this is the thing for me. You know, I don't have to worry about the code. I can do everything like from the visual standpoint. So that's, that's sort of in my mm -hmm. core, you know, if you can but skip I, that. I guess you're, when you look back into your Java days, uh, would you say that that was a good experience for you? To oh, have? yes. Yeah. I mean, whether or not it's coding or not, you know, it's really good to be able to see the other side of your profession or, you know, your, your business, I guess. So like, even if I do design, it's good to know the code, you know, and I was hands on. So again, that told me how long it takes to do certain stuff. You know, so I knew like this looks easy, but this is actually going to take another extra week for the coders to change. But this is, this sounds hard, but actually not that hard. You know, you just need to change the parameters and you'll get this. You know, those are like very simple decision making that you can start beginning doing if you do have that, you know, uh, even the shallow knowledge, what that entails. So that's interesting as well, you know. So yeah, I, I would recommend if if you do have the time, sure, you know, just try try learn coding. Okay, there's a question from anonymous attendee. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the source of your creativity slash ideas? Is there any tip you can share to keep on stimulating our creativity to come up with interesting ideas? Hmm. Well, it's always that toughest question at the end, isn't it? <laughs> to, I, mean, stimulating. <laughs> I know, right? I don't know if I'm that brilliant. That's the problem. But I think, I mean, I, I always try to stay like hungry and curious for things. That's one thing. Like yeah, when you continue, you know, you'll uh, basically you'll see more and more interesting stuff and then you'll start to get numb and bored. And that's the worst enemy, you know, of, of uh, creativity. You know, when you're bored, you don't get anything. So you just kind of need to, keep on being excited with all these diverse type of work. Um, so, you know, I don't do anything that special, but by nature, I love, you know, watching people's like crazy weird stuff online. So I'm probably in front of my computer almost all day, you know, either working or just looking for some interesting, you know, work uh, that's like scattered around the world on the, you know, online verse. 
Um, but one trick, not a trick, but one um, habit of mine is that when I look at those, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily bookmark them because I'll probably lose it in the void anyways. But I, I do this exercise where I try to break down the components of this interesting new thing that I see, you know, whether it be graphic design or digital, whatever, or installations or architecture, and try to sort of dissect what made this thing interesting for me. Um, you know, so like with Dark Ingalls did that weird ski slope on the power plant, you know, okay, that's fascinating. That's amazing. You know, but to me, like, what was it that, you know, got me excited in the first, what was that first catch? You know, what are the elements? I mean, obviously the architecture design is great, but I think the power of that concept lied in the fact that, you know, power plant, you know, skiing, like, boom, like, whoa, what? (laughs) <laughs> what did I just say? You know, it's that uniqueness coming with, from the combination of like u- utility, like a power plant and, and joy, you know, uh, joining together and that magic, you know, and, you know, making sense with all the scale and size, you know, and then the hot and cold, like that sort of contradicting elements coming into one, creating this new sort of value. So what, you know, is, uh, I do that kind of you know, explanation to myself. I just mumble to myself, okay, what, what is this? Um, and then when you do that, it kind of sticks in you, you know, and then it's a good exercise to understand what are the types of, you know, nuggets and seeds of an idea that gets you excited, which means it may be exciting to like hundred other people or a thousand other people. So at least for myself, I have that sort of equation and I try to kind of keep on updating that by adding these new, new work and not as a holistic project, but as these, you know, elements of that, you know, that, that I try to kind of add into the X plus Y plus Zs inside my mind. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, th- I guess this is related to your process, right? There, there's another follow-up question here. I would love to learn about your creative process, especially on how you come up with innovative ideas. I mean, I assume this question is more about client-related work? Potentially, or I, I don't know. Um, but Or, I mean, I you also uh... have, you know, uh, self-initiated projects and even product. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I think the easiest question answer is like, I don't, I don't separate my creative process so much. Like, uh, you know, in my mind, I work the same way, regardless if there's a client or not, there's always a uh, issue that we need to solve, you know, and then the designing and the creative idea is sort of the answer and the output is the tangible form of that. You know, so, you know, if, even if it's like a million dollar like project for Nike versus like, oh, I need to make a t-shirt for like, again, out of my pocket money, you know, my mind works the same way. That doesn't really dictate on the directions of my idea development. Um, but then I think one thing that I tend to do uh, is that I try to make prototypes in a very early phase just to test out the ideas because the mind can go anywhere. You know, it's, I can think of like crazy weird stuff, but unless I actually get that to that tangible state at the end, you know, it doesn't really mean anything. It's just like words on paper or scribbles on paper. So, you know, whenever I have like 10 different crazy ideas, I just, um, you know, for like the sour video, I did a video animatic very quickly um and for like the t-shirts you know i just cut out you know t-shirts and stuff and see if it actually makes sense or not or working with you know a fashion designer to quickly do a prototype which leads me to understanding the difficulties of the certain ideas or what actually can work and what is going to be hard like the t-shirt sizing was something that i would probably never thought about until i started actually stitching you know the cloth together so that's, I think, a very important part of my uh, sort of creative process. Like, you know, not just using your head, but using your hand. And it doesn't have to look pretty or anything, but just for your own sake, you know, move your hands and test things out, you know, as you, as you try to develop the project. And sometimes I pull the brake, you know, I do a test and then it sucks. And I'm like, ah, let's like <laughs> scrap it. Oh, so you have a lot of ideas that you actually ditch as well. Yeah, 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 as well. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's very um, easy to do when I'm doing it on my own. When there's a client, it's very hard. <laughs> so, 
uh, uh, oops, sorry, guys, you know, I, I need to pull the brakes, go back. But then I tell them, you know, like, okay, I'll, I'll go back to the drawing board. I'll do this for free for you. But I just don't think the idea is right. So give me like, you know, a quick week and then we'll try to get back to you with a better idea that's, you know, feasible and doable. A quick question from Eugene Wang. Uh, was there an audience in mind for the lyric speakers or was the idea the sole driver? Um, that one, well, there's a, a friend of mine that's running sort of the Kotodama company right now called Jin. He's actually a musician himself. He's half in a creative agency and half a musician. So he had uh, a lot of love towards music and uh, always had in mind, you know, what, how technologies can help enhance the musical experience. And, uh, you know, and I myself, well, I wasn't involved at the very beginning. So <laughs> I'd be lying if I were the, you know, initiator, but, you know, I, I personally cannot play any instrument at all, <laughs> but I love music. So the best way for me to be engaged in the music world that I love was through like visuals and like technology side, right? So that's why I, I love saying yes to music video project, despite the fact that in most cases it's like low budget, but you know, it's just basically like things I, I love being engaged in. So, you know, I think Jin, he, he had the similar thought, you know, and then, um, you know, there was the karaoke culture, you know, there was this, you know, deep learning thing that was starting to uh, come out like very, very early days though. So we were thinking, oh, they were thinking, you know, can we, you know, create something that does a much richer visualization of the lyrics itself, you know, and then if you can hear and see at the same time, will that change your perception towards, you know, music and I, which I, I think it does. And, uh, so they had that idea and our CTO Sakusha got involved and then started making the program. And originally I think they brought it to South by South, Southwest Accelerator program. And then they won something like the jury prize. Um, you know, they had that one prototype with the transparent one. And then from there, we could have just uh, stopped it. But I think everybody was, yeah, I think we, we believe this enough. You know, let's try to really get investment. Let's make a separate company. Let's, you know, put, try to put this out into the market. And they spent like two years uh, producing it. And uh, finally it went out into the market. And again, it sold out the first one just in like a year. And then, you know, during that time we already knew that we want to continue this. So we started designing the second canvas one. So I think it's a joint, you know, passion project where everybody feels like there's, there's a space for this. You know, not necessarily like we didn't do like almost zero like marketing analysis or anything like that we're like fuck yeah we love music we love like technology let's let's go and then abbey road actually is one of our um you know uh sponsors too so i think there there has been a lot of people that felt the same way you know and uh, and has been supporting us from the get-go so really appreciative of that another this one is from felix and hi felix i think uh, felix oh. is in singapore <laughs> um, question to John and Masa, can you both talk a little bit about your experience working in Asia and the US and if and how the language alters the way you work? Mm. Interesting. John? <laughs> <laughs> no, you should go for it. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> damn, that's a tough question. No, well, I think, I mean, it's interesting. You know, nowadays I like to believe that there's no borders now, like online has reached enough parts of the world that we can honestly say like the world is now connected. But because of that, you know, we do start seeing these different boundaries. It's not necessarily like the continents and the islands, but more about the language barrier, more about the time difference, you know, those things that we weren't really conscious of, you know, are, are kind of popping up. And um, I would love to think like we're a global citizen, so it doesn't really matter where we work. Um, but then again, you know, I had to return to Tokyo to, you know, uh, merge my company and, and create this new entity called whatever. And uh, you know, that made me realize it's been a while since I've, you know, worked in Japan. But because of the, that, the language is very Japanese centric and it's very, uh, uh, I wouldn't, uh, I hate saying it, but like, it's kind of more of a monotonous culture. You know, it, it lacks diversity compared to obviously places like America, right? So, you know, with that mind, 
in mind, you know, I, I think it doesn't matter where you are, but staying connected uh, with the diverse group of people is very important for your own creativity, but also for, you know, how your work actually reaches a wider audience. So that's what I'm trying to be uh, conscious about, uh, regardless of my whereabouts. And, but, but especially when, when I'm in Japan, you know, I want to make sure I'm not just doing everything in Japanese. You know, I'm involving people from different parts of the globe to get that diverse perspectives into the ideations, but also creating a strong enough communications that's not just, you know, working in Japan, but works universally. Because again, the world is connected, you know, if even for like small, I don't know, like a laundry shop in Japan, you know, if I were to make something that only works for the Japanese market, you, you know, there's so much people you can reach. But, but if in case I do have communication design that can potentially work across the globe, you know, who knows, you know, someone in Brazil might, uh, you know, check that out online and it, you know, catches fire there and becomes a massive, you know, viral thing, for example. So there's, when you know that there's that potential, you know, I think all the creatives need to work towards that rather than, you know, sure, if it works in Japan, that'll probably, you know, make the client happy, but maybe there's more, uh, you know, that you can think about. I don't know if that answers Felix's question, but. Uh, I think that answers the question for me. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, we're at eight o'clock here. Um, there are a few more questions, but I, I'm, unfortunately we ran out of time. So I want to thank you on behalf of TDC for sharing your work and amazing process. Um, and uh, yeah, you're welcome to join more of our conferences. We have a lot of coming up. <laughs> thank and, you. Uh, yeah, and uh, I think Carol can share more about, you know, the upcoming um, programs that we will be updating the website with a few more upcoming talks that we hope to be even more interesting. Um, but it's hard to, you know, top what you're, you're saying today, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank awesome. you very well, much. Thank you, nice everyone. Meeting you. For listening. All right, take care. Have a great night. Yes, stay well. <laughs>